So tonight in our stream, we're going to do a, a quick intro in terms of government and politics and defining what government and politics are. We're going to talk about what the actual purpose of government is. We're going to look at the Enlightenment thinkers um, that have influenced American government. And we're also going to, to look at the types of representative democracy. And like I said, if you have questions as we go, feel free to ask them. So let's get a definition of government. So if I ask people what government is, a lot of times people just say, well, you know, that's just the, that's the men and women in Washington, D.C. who make decisions for us. You're actually, when you say that, you're actually kind of going more for a, a definition of politics than you are government. So our official de definition of government is the institutions that make public policy. Now let's kind of break that apart. Uh, so when I say institutions, a lot of times when I say, well, your institutions are the Congress, the presidency, and the courts, people are like, oh, yeah, just the three branches of government. So the, the government should just see the branches that make public policy. Well, yes and no. The problem is, is that within the executive branch, you have the presidency and you also have the bureaucracy, okay? And the bureaucracy really is its own institution, even though it falls under the presidency. So real quick, when we think about what each of these does, probably you've had this at some point um, in your education, but the institution of Congress, what does Congress do? Congress simply makes laws. And we know that it's made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate, it's bicameral. Those are concepts we'll, we'll talk about later this year. But the job of the Congress of the United States is to make law, or another word for law is public policy. Then you have the institution, which is the presidency. So what is the job of the presidency or the executive? Well, his job is to execute the law, okay? So to actually enforce the law. A lot of people hear the word execute and they think about, well, that's like the death penalty. It has other meanings as well too, okay? The president's not executing people. The president's job is to take the laws that have been passed by Congress um, that have had his signature or that have maybe has been overridden because um, that's a check and balance of the presidency. And it's his job to enforce those laws, to carry out those laws that Congress has made. Now, he can't do that himself. If you think about the thousands of laws that are on the books, that would be impossible for the president to do. So he has another institution to help him, and that institution is the bureaucracy, which is also part of the executive branch. So what does the bureaucracy do? Well, it's kind of all those government agencies that you think about when you think about the government. Things like the FBI, the uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, as well as things like all those government departments, the Department of Education, the Department of Defense, the Department of State. I could literally spend the entire night tonight just listing bureaucratic agencies. But the bureaucracy helps the president to enforce those laws and to carry out those laws. So for example, if Congress passes a, a law that we're gonna go to the, uh, I guess the Mars, okay? We're gonna go to Mars by 2030, okay? Well, Congress has passed the law, now the, the president needs to carry it out, okay? And so he's gonna send that to the correct bureaucratic agency, which in this case would be NASA. And it would be NASA's job to ensure that that law occurs and happens, okay? And then your last institution of government, your fourth one is the courts, okay? Now the picture on your screen shows the, the Supreme Court, which is usually the court that most people think of when they think about the federal court system, but it's not the only federal court, okay? One of the things that we'll talk about in this course is that there are many different federal courts. The Supreme Court is the highest court in the United States. It's the only one which is listed in the Constitution under Article 3, but it is certainly not the only federal court, okay? You have federal courts of appeals. You have federal district courts. No matter where you live in the country, you have a federal district court within driving time of, of where you're at, okay? So the courts are the last institution, and the, what's the job of the courts? It's to interpret the law. So when we talk about interpreting the law, what does that mean? Well, it just means that they're to look at the law um, that have been passed by, by Congress or by the states for that matter, and interpret if, number one, what they say, and number two, are they constitutional? Meaning, are they aligned to our constitution? If something's unconstitutional, that means it goes against our constitution, and the courts are gonna overturn that law. 
So government is the institutions that make public policy. And those are our four institutions of government, all of which make public policy or make law. So that's our definition of uh, government. Let's keep on going here. What about the functions? Now that we understand what the government does, what does the uh, government actually do? Okay, we talked about the, the definition, but what do they actually do? Um, so I'm actually curious to hear from those of you that are, are here live with us. Um, maybe in the chat, go ahead and type a function of government that you think that our government does. And I put some pictures up to kind of jog your memory. So I'll give you a, a minute here to put in some answers. Okay, so I see one that just popped up that says national security. Yeah, absolutely. The job of a government is national security, okay? Protecting uh, their citizens. What other things do we think that uh, are functions of our government? Okay, so provide highways and roads for, for us. Okay, so I would just put that in general as um, promoting the general welfare. OK, uh, that's exactly right. OK, we're going to provide services that um, our people need and you and I pay into those services, um, providing public goods and services. I'll go into that. So like an example of a, a public good or service in the bottom left or excuse me, the bottom right. Don't know the difference between left and right uh, are things like hospitals. Yep. Socialize the young. Absolutely. That's that's a great one. And you see that in the, the top picture. Actually, that top picture demonstrates two things. Not only does the government socialize the young, don't get confused with socialism, that's a, a different thought here, but what they do is they um, help our young citizens, including all of you, that's the reason why you're taking this course is because it's required by the state, not necessarily AP Gov, but a government course is required by every state in the United States, um, because they want you to understand what it means to be a citizen, the responsibilities of a citizen, and how your government works. That's how we socialize you. We, we teach you about how our system works. But another public service the government provides is your schools, okay? Um, unless you attend a private school, your gov or government is the one who is funding your, your education. I see collect taxes. Yep, absolutely. The government, as much as we hate them, you know, I'd love to have the extra money that uh, comes out of my paycheck back to me. Um, but we all need to pay tax. Why? Well, because if you don't pay tax, you don't get services. We don't get those roads. We don't get those schools, um, et cetera. And so, yeah, you guys are right on fire in terms of things that um, are functions of the government. So let's talk about what politics are then. So politics is often what people think of when they think of government, okay? So politics we define as, uh, it determines who we select as our governmental leaders and what policies these leaders pursue, okay? So we live in a, in a democracy, and if I'm very specific to that, we live in a representative democracy or what we call a republic, okay? And in that representative democracy or republic, you and I, as the voters, or at least you will be here in a couple of years, um, depending how close you are to your 18th birthday, you're all going to be great uh, because you've had AP government and you're going to register to vote and everybody's going to vote in the very first election that they're eligible to. Well, that's good. That's what needs to happen in a representative democracy. And it's OK that I might have one political belief and you might have another and you might be a huge fan of this political candidate and somebody else might be a fan of another political candidate. That's great. Really, that's the beauty of our system. The politics side of thing is you and I selecting who we think should best govern our, um, our system and the political decisions that they should, should make. OK, so, for example, and I'm, I'm just using random examples as I will do throughout the, the course. Let's say that I'm a, a Republican. OK, I have conservative beliefs. So I'm going to want someone in office who represents my conservative beliefs because I can't go to Washington, D.C. and make law myself. I have a job and other things that I, I do. So as a result, I'm going to select people who kind of politically um, mirror my thought processes and my um, ideas on conservative issues, if that's my political leaning, okay? And so that's the idea of, um, of the politics side, 
okay? The government side is just the, the institutions, okay? The politics side are the people that we elect to those, or in some cases, appoint to those institutions to carry out the work, okay? So if we feel that the institution of Congress, part of government, is not doing a great job, well, you and I have some control over that, okay? You and I are able to thus take our representative who have, or your state senators and choose someone else to run against them and campaign and work to campaign for that person and, and hope to, to get someone else there. So the politics is really the side of who we select as our leaders and then the policies those leaders pursue, okay? So Republicans will pursue conservative policies, Democrats will pursue liberal policies. Moderates, although it's not a political party, it's a place on the political spectrum, that's for another uh, stream. Moderates are someone that might sometimes lean conservative to the right and sometimes might lean liberal to the, the left, okay? Those are the things that we consider. So how do we come about determining who we want to elect? Well, we watch things like debates. We attend things like rallies. We, in, this, in today's world, we check our social media. You can see stories on Snapchat from political campaigns. Even, even better yet, Twitter's a great, great place to find information directly from the candidates themselves. So we are able to synthesize, to take in all that information and decide like, yeah, this is the person that we would really like um, that we feel best represents our own political ideas and needs. So that's the idea behind politics. So government is the institutions that, that do the, the work, okay? It's like the machine. And the politics is the people that we elect and the policies that they carry out within those institutions. And just want to remind you, if you're coming in late, uh, if you have questions at any point, just stick them in the chat or press that little ask a question button at the bottom. So next question, though, I'm going to throw to you is on the enlightenment. So who are enlightenment thinkers that have had an impact on American government? If you've taken world history before this course, I don't need to know every enlightenment thinker. I just want to know which ones have had an impact on our American government. I already see John Locke coming up. That's everyone's favorite American, or excuse me, enlightenment thinker that's had an impact on America. I see, uh, okay, I see some spelling, but it's okay because they're foreign names. Um, so I see Montesquieu, yep. I 100% agree with that. I see uh, John Jack or uh, John Jacques Rousseau. Um, oh, interesting. So someone's put throwing up here Alex de Toc Alexi de Tocqueville. Um, I would agree that he has a, a influence on um, American government, but I wouldn't say at the very beginning. Okay, um, Alexi de, de Tocqueville writes in the 1800s. Okay, and so he's not going to have influence on our government right at the very beginning. Actually, de Tocqueville is a big one for a push. Okay, so three big ones I've, I've seen you all type here, but John Locke, Montesquieu, and um, Jean Jacques Rousseau. Okay, now if you're thinking, well, my teacher said some other ones, if they, they may, maybe have said Thomas Hobbes, that's okay. Um, Thomas Hobbes has also had an influence on American government, but the ones that you are most likely to see on the AP test and the ones that's really important to know are John Locke, uh, Montesquieu, and uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So let's talk a little bit about those three Enlightenment thinkers, okay? So here are our three, three guys, okay? Um, in terms of when they are writing, we're talking about the 16, late 1600s, early 1700s, because the Enlightenment is happening in Europe. So this is not a world history cast, but you should understand what the Enlightenment actually is, okay? So what's the Enlightenment? Well, basically, consider that Europe kind of turned the, the lights off um, of their brain cells. For a couple hundred years during the middle ages the medieval period the dark ages whatever you want to call it okay um, and there really wasn't a whole lot of progress that was made in europe um, in scientific uh, inventions and thought okay in writing and art um, we just kind of didn't didn't move forward and there are a lot of reasons for that okay deadly diseases like smallpox that are excuse me the black death that wiped out millions of people, um, some of the, the governmental systems, the wars, etc. 
But what you need to understand is that in the late 1600s, early 1700s, it's kind of like the lights come back on in our brain in, in Europe. And we get this period called the Enlightenment. Why is it called the Enlightenment? Because people are kind of enlightened again. People start thinking. Um, people start questioning. Uh, a, a perfect example is during this period, people start to question the authority of really two big institutions. Number one, the church, meaning the Catholic church. And number two, political institutions. They start to question things that they've always just accepted before. And John Locke, uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau, as well as uh, Charles de Baron de Montesquieu are all three people um, who start to question those things. And their questioning that happens before the American Revolution ends up having a profound impact on the government that ends up being set up for that you and I live under today. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those. So let's start with John Locke. So if you take AP world history, AP US history, AP government um, throughout your high school career, you're gonna hear John Locke in every single one of those classes. Why? Because he really has this major impact on government and history. So John Locke writes a, a very famous pamphlet, okay, or essay called The Two Treatises of Government, okay? And under, in this essay, he proposes the idea that um, there's something called natural law, okay? And basically the idea of natural law is that you and I were born with certain God-given rights. No king, no monarch, no priest, no pope gave us these rights. These rights were inherently given to us. They're inherently natural to us by God. By being a human being, by being born, you and I naturally have these rights, or what he calls natural law. Okay, And so in, in this uh, essay, he continues to go on that no one really should be subjected to the political power of another without their consent, okay? Meaning that even under a monarchy, even though we don't elect the, the king or the, the queen, um, if the people don't consent to them go being governed, then they need to be removed, okay? We see that happen in the glorious revolution in, in England, okay, in the 1600s. They feel like the monarch at the time, uh, Charles I, isn't ruling well. And so they remove him. There's a whole English Civil War. Uh, he's removed. He's executed. Uh, they chop off his head. The English love chopping off people's heads during that time period. Well, in a couple hundred years prior to that. Um, and uh, they set up a, a parliamentary democracy. Well, really, they had a parliamentary, uh, well, in some ways, okay, that they take away some of that authority from the king, okay? Um, and later the king would be restored. But the idea I'm trying to, to get to you here is not that you need to know that, not for this course at least, um, but the idea that John Locke is proposing is that people can only rule if the people that they are ruling consent to them ruling. And the minute that the people no longer consent to them ruling, well, they should be able to get rid of that leader whether they live in a monarchy, whether they live in some form of democracy or otherwise. So he says that this natural law really obligated people to rebel when the rule of the kings didn't uh, respect the consent of the governed. He goes on specifically to, to talk about what he sees as the natural rights that, that we are granted mm -hmm. simply by our birth. The first being life, the second being liberty or freedom, and the third being property. Now, you may have just been looking at that and may have been like, well, I thought it was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, what you're thinking of is the Declaration of Independence, which is influenced by John Locke. Um, but Thomas Jefferson kind of changes up a little bit about natural law. I'll, uh, I'll come back to that here in just a little bit. So that's John Locke. What about Jean-Jacques Rousseau? Okay. Well, the key word that you need to remember with Jean-Jacques Rousseau is the social contract, okay? So he kind of sees um, humanity. He's a philosopher, so he's thinking about humanity. And he, he says, you know, men are born free. He kind of believes the same thing that John Locke does. But everywhere he's in chains, okay? Now, that doesn't mean physical slavery, although that, of course, existed at the time. But he's saying that 
men really don't have power. Okay, maybe it's that they don't have economic power because of poverty or because of their their station or situation in life. Maybe it's that they don't have political power. And those are the chains that really hold men down. Okay, now, of course, he uses man. Okay, um, he's probably thinking mostly men, white men, particularly, um, because it wasn't seen as women having um, political rights like you and I see them today. But the idea is that human beings in general um, are basically born within within chains, okay, figuratively. And so he proposes this idea of the social contract, which is basically an agreement of free and equal people to abandon certain, certain natural rights in order to get the uh, protection and safety um, from the whoever the governed. Okay. So for example, let me let me break this down. What he says is that we as the people, and I'm going to give the example of, of Europe at the time that he's writing this, we as the people agree to allow the king to rule, okay? We agree to give up some of our natural rights, okay, in order for the king to rule. But in exchange, because this is a contract, it's not one way, in exchange, we expect the king to protect us. OK, um, and not to enslave us. OK, so that's the idea. The people will allow the king to rule. OK, as long as the, ki the king allows to uh, or establishes a government that is fair and that allows the people to be protected. But he says the same as Locke. The minute that the king no longer does that, that he or the monarch is no longer agreeing to that social contract, they're no longer um, giving you your rights, they're no longer providing you with safety, then the people have every right to overthrow that monarch. So he envisions this idea of this incredibly important word that you need to know for AP Gov of popular sovereignty, okay? That basically um, the people have the ultimate ruling authority. Now understand that anytime you see popular in government, I want you to think of the word people. Um, if you're taking some notes, I would just tell you to write popular equals people, okay? Sovereignty equals rule, okay? So people rule. So the government gets its power from the people. Whether you're in a democracy, whether you're in a, any type of government, the people get to decide when your time ruling is over, okay? Now, in a democracy, we do that via elections. In some other type of system where you have a leader in place that's not duly elected, well, they overthrow them, maybe through a coup d'etat or a junta or something else of that nature. Um, but he's saying that governments are envisioned by popular sovereignty, okay? The people have the ultimate authority, okay? Yes, we might elect or yes, we might have a king, whatever, um, but the people have the ultimate authority. So that's Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So real quick review, Locke is natural rights, okay? Jean-Jacques Rousseau is the social contract. Let's go to our, our last one here. So Montesquieu, okay? So like uh, Rousseau, he recognizes that both the sovereign administrative uh, aspects of, of governmental power, okay? He understands the idea and agrees with the idea of the social contract. What sets Montesquieu apart is that he argues for the separation of powers in the government. He doesn't feel like all the power of government should be in the hands of one person, i.e. a monarch, okay? He feels that the powers of government should be separated between different institutions or different branches. And he proposes that there should be a, an executive and a legislative and a judicial branch of this government on which power should be separated. So that's the idea of Montesquieu. So maybe as you are um, going through these with me, you're starting to think, oh, I can see where, where those things are involved in our government. So I'm going to ask a, another question to you. Um, put in the, in the comment bar here, where do you see, and you can choose anyone, Locke, Montesquieu, or Rousseau, where do you see their ideas in our government? Maybe you can say a document, maybe you can say a specific thing about our government, but I'd like to hear where do you see those ideas at? So I see someone said the Constitution, maybe if you can just say, um, Brace said if you can say um, what specifically in the Constitution? 
Okay, so yeah, someone just said the the three branches of government. Yep, absolutely. Declaration of Independence. So, um, John, maybe if you can speak to what in the Declaration of Independence, and specifically, like, who? I'm curious to to hear what your thoughts are. Separation of powers. Yeah, absolutely. Separation of powers in the Constitution. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so while you're pondering that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a cheat sheet here. Okay, so here are some examples. This is not the be all end all list, um, but these are important examples. So where do we see natural rights from John Locke in the Declaration of Independence? Okay, um, when Thomas Jefferson talks about the um, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness being inalienable or unalienable rights, meaning they cannot be taken away. So instead of using the word natural rights, he uses the word unalienable. Okay. Um, he, uh, or excuse me, natural rights can also be seen in the, the Bill of Rights, okay? Um, in the social contract, we see the social contract in the in the Declaration of Independence, because in the Declaration of Independence, which, by the way, there's going to be a, a live stream on next week, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, the uh, part of the, actually, the really the first and second paragraph go into the idea that they basically take from, um, Ma, or excuse me, Rousseau, um, they take the idea of the social contract and they say, look, when a king has become a tyrant um, and he no longer protects his people and he no longer um, <laughs> respects the rights of his people, then we have every right to overthrow that government. OK, so we see the con or excuse me, the social contract there. We also see the social contract within our, our constitution via elections and things like that. When it comes to separ separation of powers, well, that's the whole constitution in and of itself. Our constitution creates um, three separate branches of, of government that all have different powers. And then in Federalist 51, which um, maybe you've read and maybe you haven't yet, but we've got a stream coming up on it next week. In Federalist 51, our, um, or excuse me, Madison talks about in Federalist 51 that our constitution separates powers because Madison's trying to convince people who are scared of this new constitution ratifying this, specifically anti-federalists, um, that it's okay, okay? That it's not the end of the, the world and that um, one of the ways that we ensure that our government doesn't become too powerful, which is what the federalists were, or excuse me, the anti-federalists were worried about, um, is that we have a separation of powers. So he talks about that Federalist 51. And then finally, popular sovereignty, the idea that the people are the rulers that have the ultimate authority. We see that in the Declaration of Independence. We see that in the, in the Constitution as well, too. So those Enlightenment thinkers have had a profound impact on our, our government. And I guarantee you, you will see them again and again as, as we go forward. So last thing we're going to cover tonight are the types of representative democracy, okay? So political scientists really theorize that um, under the umbrella of democracy, okay, there are really three different types, okay? One is participatory, one is pluralism, or maybe you've heard the word hyper-pluralism, and one is elite theory or elitism, Okay, and we're going to take a moment to look at each of those. And then I'm going to be curious to hear maybe which one you think our government operates under in the United States. And there really is no right or wrong answer to that. So I made up this little uh, chart, which is a nice little cheat sheet for you that um, basically goes over each of these. OK, um, and this is going to be in the, the recorded version. I'll have this PowerPoint up, but feel be Feel free to take a picture with your phone um, if you feel like this is something that will be helpful for you later on. So let's talk about a participatory democracy. So this type of democracy depends on the direct participation of many, okay? Um, if not most of society, um, not only in our government, but in public life as well. So what does that mean? Um, well, first off, I don't want you to think that a participatory democracy must be a direct democracy, where in a direct democracy, like you had in ancient Athens or you have in little towns in New England in the United States, where everybody participates, everybody votes on every issue. You don't have people that you elect um, to or you send to represent you in a legislator. You participate yourself. Um, 
it can be, participatory democracy can be a direct democracy, but also a republic or representative democracy is also a participatory democracy. Why? Because um, most of the people um, try to or should participate in the government by voting. Now, you can make an argument for here, and I'm going to play devil's advocate for a, a moment here. When we talk about um, participatory democracy, and we talk about the definition saying that most of society participates, well, if we think about our elections and the percentage of eligible voters who actually go and vote on a presidential election, well, let me throw it to you guys. How? What percentage of people do you think typically that's eligible to vote typically votes in a presidential election? Just throw out some numbers. What what percent? I see 35%. I see a 40%. I see 64%. That's very uh, specific. Um, 50, less, or excuse me, less than 50. So here's the actual number. On its highest, highest uh, turnouts, 60%. Okay. Typically, though, it's just over 50%. So can I really say that the vast majority of people in a, in at least in our representative republic today, okay, participate in government? Uh, I don't know. But that also depends on your definition of participate. Maybe people don't vote, but maybe they write their congressman, or maybe they stay up to date with the, the news, and um, they petition, or they, they protest, etc. So there are lots of ways to participate as well, too. Okay, In a participatory democracy, especially direct democracies, people will vote directly or for laws and other matters that affect them instead of voting for people to represent their interests, okay? So generally, the vast majority of the time, a participatory democracy is a direct democracy. So why don't we do this in the United States, okay? Lots of people have issues with Congress. They say that Congress just doesn't function. So why don't we just get rid of Congress and have the people vote on everything? Well, think about it. It's really just not feasible. There are 320 odd million people in the United States. Now, obviously not all of them would be 18 or older, et cetera, okay? Um, but you and I um, just often don't have the time to sit down and review every law. Um, we certainly don't have the ability for all 320 million of us to debate unless we'd use social media, but if you think about your own social media, that would kind of be a hot mess. And so, it's really just not feasible when you have a large population. So the reason why, why you really only see participatory democracies or direct democracies in places like small town in New England is because they have small, small populations. So when you only have 100 people in your town, you can gather all those 100 people at a central location and debate and discuss issues. Um, on a national level, though, that's really, really hard to do. The second theory of democracy is pluralism, OK? So pluralism states that groups with shared influence um, influence public policy by pressing their concerns through organized efforts. And we call those groups interest groups. We're going to talk a lot about interest groups this year in, in government, okay? And when I say an interest group, maybe some come to mind, like the National Rifle Association, the National Education Association, the um, American... Um, Association of Retired Persons, AARP. There are tons and tons and tons and tons of interest groups. So basically what, what they say with pluralism is, the theory is that these interest groups, okay, people come together who share an interest. So if we are talking about the National Rifle Association, the NRA, those are people who are interested in gun rights and gun education and, and um, gun safety, okay? And they come together because they have that shared influence and they want to influence public policy. They want to influence laws. Hence why every time you hear something that's being proposed in Congress that deals with um, guns of any type, the NRA is involved in that, okay? Because they have an interest in that. But maybe if it's a, a gun law that deals with schools, not only is the NRA involved, but the NEA, the National Education Association, is going to be involved as well too. So because of open access to various institutions of government and public officials, organized groups can compete with one another for control over policy. So that's what's happening in that example that I just gave you. If you're talking about an a, um, issue around or a law around guns in schools, which is a hot button issue in the United States 
Celtics right now. Um, the NEA and the NRA are probably going to have very different opinions in terms of what should happen. And that's okay. That's part of the democracy. But both of them are going to compete by trying to convince congressmen and congresswomen of what to do with those laws, okay? So they're going to try to convince them to pass or not to pass certain laws. Uh, and they're going to get the people who are part of their interest groups to help them do that. So if you're part of the NRA, they're going to send you an email or something in the mail and tell you, hey, you know, Congress is considering this law right now. We need you to call your congressman and say, hey, we this is not a good idea and here's why. In some cases, they actually provide you with the script to, to actually read. Or these organizations might hire, these interest groups might hire a lobbyist to actually physically go and meet with the congressman or congresswoman and actually um, try to convince them to vote a certain way. So sometimes, though, pluralism can become hyperpluralism. And hyperpluralism is just pluralism like on steroids, okay? What has happened is that interest groups, there are so many interest groups that have become so competitive. Um, that have so many varying ideas that are pulling congressmen and congresswomen in so many different directions that really our government fails to function. And so some people might consider that the reason why um, not much has changed when it comes to the issue of guns is because of hyperpluralism. Um, that's just an idea. I'm not saying that I, you know, I agree or disagree here. I'm just saying that that's an example, uh, it could be an example of hyperpluralism. And then last is the elite theory, or sometimes also called elitism. So in an elite democracy, elected representatives make decisions and act as trustees for the people who elected them. So a type of representative democracy here. However, it recognizes an inequity in the spread of power among the populace and the elite, okay? And the elite are the people with the resources, i.e. the money, and influence. And basically the elite, people that follow elite theory believe that really, our, um, our government is dominated by the elite, the people that have the money, okay? And arguments that uh, people that would, would make that believe in elite theory would say like, well, look, the average presidential campaign now, when we look at the last um, campaign, the 2016 campaign between both final candidates, not even just the, the ones that were in the primary election, over a billion dollars was spent. Now, that's not to say that they're spending all their own money, okay? They're certainly not spending all of their own money. They get donations, et cetera. But they're spending a lot of, a big portion of their money, okay? For someone that's a school teacher like me, you know, I don't have hundreds of millions of dollars or even a million dollars that I can put out to, to launch a campaign. And thus, when we look at the, our members of Congress, our elected officials, um, even at the state level, a lot of times these people are... Um, wealthy. And I'm not to say that they're um, millionaires or, or billionaires, but they generally are upper middle class or, or wealthy. Okay. They have a lot of money, which allows them to more easily run for election. But they also have a lot of power otherwise. They come from powerful positions. Maybe they were lawyers in high courts. Maybe they were um, um, CEOs of, of businesses, etc. So elitism contends that our society, like all societies, is divided along class lines and that the upper class elite pulls the strings of, of government. So honestly, um, there are different pros and cons to each of these types of representative democracy that kind of um, push you to saying which one of these you believe the United States is. Um, some people might say, yeah, it's we have an elite system. Some people might say we have pluralism that blend, that bleeds on hyperpluralism. Others might say that um, we really have a mix of all of them, but it's important for you to be able to understand each of those forms of democracy. So guys, that is everything for the, uh, the first live stream here. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the, the sidebar here.